All right, welcome to the Bears Gym today, folks. Um, just as a side note, if you happen to see a big furry bear-like creature come to the door there, don't be alarmed. That's just my mascot, Boris. He's on the prowl today. He's, he's loose. Sort of. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's okay. It's all good. Don't be alarmed. Okay, we are in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 14 on this beautiful summery day here in Wisconsin. Isaiah 14, we get a little insight into the end times. We get a little insight into the past and to the present of where Israel was at historically and we have a little glimpse into what Lucifer was what he is now and what he will be in the future when God assigns him his place into the pit of hell temporarily until the thousand years is over at the end of the tribulation period. And all the kings of the earth are going to say, and you are the man who troubled the nations? Because without his God-given powers that God ordained him with in the beginning when he created him, Lucifer was just an angelic being, but he was lifted up in his heart. Pride Pride goeth before a fall. Whether you're an angelic being or a human being, a humanoid like myself, be it somewhat bear-like, you know, for those of you that are bears out there, we're still human. And we must all come to the place of being subservient to our Father Yahweh. And as we know him now, as in the New Testament era, Jesus Christ. Through his son, Jesus Christ, we gain access into the eternal realm and understand that he is the creator. Jesus is the creator. He created all things. They're created for him and by him for the pleasure of the Father. And Lucifer, at some point in his time, because of his beauty, his magnificence, his, his strength, he became exalted in his mind, his heart, whatever that might be for an angelic being. And he actually thought he would ascend to the throne of God and usurp God's authority and take him down and set himself up as God. But he will be where all mankind will be who have disobeyed and refused the authority of God Almighty, and that is in the lake of fire. Those of us that have submitted to his beautiful will, which is pleasing, it brings joy and eternity, eternal life. Those of us that have submitted to his will, we will be in eternity with him in the eternal realms, the halls of our fathers. Those that have preceded us in death unto eternal life in Jesus Christ. Lucifer has betrayed many. When Lucifer says, I just want to be friends. I just want to be neutral with you. I, I, no, no problems, just I want to be friends. Beware. There's no such thing for the enemy to be on neutral ground. There is no neutral ground for the enemy. There is no compromise for them. It's either you will play on his rules or they will try to destroy you. That's what the enemy does. Jesus came to bring division between families, friends, churches, homes, countries. He brought that division because there is no gray area in Jesus Christ. You are either following Jesus Christ or you're not. They're saints and ain'ts. You either either are or are or you're not. Okay? Okay. 
So there's no neutral ground with the enemy. You cannot compromise with the movements of false religion and so forth to gain ground, gain friendship. Because there is no friendship with the world. The world will betray you. When you seek to stand up for Jesus Christ, they will betray you. As long as you hide in the shadows and don't stand up for truth and righteousness in Christ, they won't bother you too much. But when you choose to stand up for Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted. That's what the Bible says. He did not come to bring just a happy fellowship club. Believe it or not, he did not bring that. He came to draw a very fine line in the ground, in the sand as you may, razor sharp. And you're either on one side with, of light with Jesus Christ or on you're on the dark side. You're either on one side or the other. You can't be neutral. You can't be on the fence post. You either are or you're not. Okay. All right, with all that chewing of the flab, let's go on. <laughs> Too much chewing of the flab. Sorry about that. Isaiah 14. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Isn't that interesting? The strangers. In the end times, the strangers will be those Gentiles who have made it through all of that, the tribulation period. They will be there survivors, not many, you know, there will be billions killed. Let's say if the earth population is five, six, seven billion when the tribulation happens, most of them billions are going to be killed off and there will be maybe one billion left, maybe two tops, if you, you know, add up the numbers and so forth. There will be tremendous amount of chaos, death, wars, famines. I don't want to be there. So I realize when God says, if you love me, keep my commandments, obey me, love me. And this is how you keep his commandments. You believe in him, you obey him, you love him. You choose to please him, not your own flesh. You choose to please him. It's about taking up your cross and following him. And that's not a road of many friends. Even in the church, you're going to find... Those that oppose you, if you choose to pick up your cross and follow the Lord and choose to deny yourself from alcoholic beverages, choose to deny yourself from the worldly pleasures, they won't like you because they want to say, well, you can't be too strict, okay? You got to have a little, you know, social drinking to have friends. No, you don't. You don't. This is America. We have more soda pop then they have water in Africa, okay? There's no reason for you to drink alcoholic beverages in the United States. Now, you might disagree with me, and that's fine with you, because God doesn't really judge those that have a little wine. Let's say, well, I would just have a little wine at dinner. Well, good for you, you know? God doesn't judge that, okay? But in this day and age, the wine you drink now is not the wine they used to have, but fermented grapes. Now you got jazzed up wine that's basically liquor, almost. And it will intoxicate you, and it will help you make bad decisions in your life. But I'm not going to judge drinking, not drinking. But what God does judge is drunkenness, okay? And for myself, I'll tell you, it's like for a bear going into a donut shop. Like myself, if I go into a donut shop and I see all them donuts there, do you really think I'm going to have one donut? No, I'm not going to have just one donut. I'm going to have a whole box, like a pig. Okay, so that's why I stay out of the donut shops. Okay, and if you you have a problem with drink, you buy a six pack of beer, you buy your bottles of beer or a big thing of wine or whatever, you're going to have just one glass? No, probably not. You're probably going to have three or four. And by the end of the night, you don't really care what your kids are doing or your friends are doing, even what you're doing. Your reason, your common sense goes out the window when you drink an alcoholic beverages, they intoxicate you. All right, I'm chewing the flab. Hopefully I didn't offend you, those that are drinking Christians. I understand parts of the world, that's all there is, that you don't have 
you know, soda pop and all that. You have, you know, beer and wine and all that kind of stuff, and, and you do. I'm not judging you, and God's not judging you. God judges drunkenness. Well, let's move along. I'm chewing the flab too much, and I don't want to hit a sore subject. For those of you, my brethren, do that are have a glass of wine or beer at your dinner time. That's your business. I guess I'm just simply making a fact, not even to promote soda pop or bottled water or whatever in the United States. It just, there's no reason for us to, you know. Here I'm back, um, I'm back chewing the flap again, aren't I? You know, in the Middle East, in, in those days, during the time of Jesus, and they probably did drink plenty of wine. They mixed the wine in the, in the, the skins of water. It kept them clean. That's what they did. That was good. That was wise. But in our day and age, you pop open these bottles that have been jacked up with sugar and fermentation to create a huge alcoholic effect. And you're, it's kind of dangerous ground. I know it would be dangerous ground if it was a bear having a glass of wine because, you know, I, I have no, you know, like a donut chop. You know, I would, if it tastes good, you start drinking more and more and more. Pretty soon you're making bad decisions. You don't know where your kids are at and like that. Okay, I'm, I'm done chewing the flap on that one. Okay, bear's done with that. Okay, my pie hole's shut. Here you go. Not talking about that anymore. Okay, we were talking about Israel and Gentiles and those that have made it through the tribulation. And God is going to choose Israel again. He hasn't really chosen them now really, to be his people as he's going to hear because they don't accept him. You know, it's like being a dad and your children reject you. It's like you can't really exercise your dadship or your love to them because they reject you. They reject your authority. They reject you when you say, no, you can't get drunk. You can't fornicate. You can't, you know, smoke dope on my back porch. A good dad steps in and says, no, you're not. You're either going to get punished or you're going to get out of my house, or you will obey, and we'll be good. Okay, so a good dad's going to get involved and discipline his children. He's going to correct them when they do wrong. doesn't matter if they're little kids or they're adults. If he sees kids going out of line, a good dad's going to step in and intervene. Okay? Israel does not respect their father. They try to obey, which they don't. There's no animal sacrifices in Israel. They want to have, you know, Kabbalah stuff and have uh, the Torah. And those are good. That's fine. Okay. The well, Kabbalah is not good. But the Torah, their law, some parts of it, you know, so forth. If it would lead them back to Jesus Christ. But see, they reject Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the promise from Yahweh. And you reject the Son, so you reject the Father. And the Epistle of John speaks very much about that. If you reject the Son, you reject the Father. If you reject the Father, you, you reject the Son. Okay, so Israel has rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. So they are under great uh, suffering now because they have rejected God who put them there. Okay, but one day will be a, there will be a unification of Christian Gentiles and Christian Jews because at that time they will realize that Jesus was the Messiah, was the true Savior, and they will then be worshipers of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's taking me a long time to get past verse 1, but okay, here we go. We're getting to get past verse 1. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. Kind of interesting, during the tribulation period, as they did in Germany and in the Soviet Union, it wasn't just the Germans, excuse me, I wipe off a little bear sweat there, wasn't just the Germans that oppressed the Jews. The Russians during World War II and pre-World War II oppressed the Jews also. Killed many of them. 
but that was kind of glossed over because of Hitler's atrocities. They kind of glossed over what the Russians did to the Jews um, uh, in the, uh, the lower southern parts of Russia where you had Jews and Germans alike, the lower Volga. They were oppressed and massacred by the thousands, but the world kind of ignored that because they felt that Hitler was the greater threat and they were probably right. And the world kind of teamed up together to kind of put an end in World War II to what never really got finished in World War I. And so they kind of did it again. And I understand I'm, my lineage goes back to German roots and so forth, but also goes back to some Russian roots and some Scottish roots. And the Jews were oppressed. And during the tribulation period, towards the end of time, they were once again going to be oppressed by these nations until, until the end of the tribulation. And then the thousand year will happen. Then the, the Jews will turn the table because of the Lord. And the Lord will give them that strength. And the Lord then will allow the Jews then to oppress those people to be their servants and so forth. You know, it, you know things come around. You know, maybe not immediately, but things do. Chickens do come home to roost. Okay. They come back to the pen. They, what you did in your past sometimes shows back up to haunt you. And what people have done to the Jews will come back to haunt them. That's just the way it is because they were God's chosen people before us Gentiles were born again and allowed to come and be grafted into the tree because of Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm getting past verse 2 here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Verse 3 of Isaiah 14. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. So once again, the, during the tribulation period, the Jews will be oppressed and uh, put in bondage once again. But God will bring an end to that. Verse 4 that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindered. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet and they break forth into singing. Now, why is the earth bringing forth singing and rest? Well, we're about to find out here. But I want to make one note. We have seen in our lifetime, in this last decade or two, we've seen big shakeup in the Middle East. We've seen regime changes, turmoil, civil war, where they've displace one dictator, you know, over, you know, three, four, five different countries now. But guess what? There's like a hundred more guys that want to be the next dictator, you know? So you can never really just go in and have a war and then pull out and expect it to be all good. It's never, it, mankind's not like that. You got a lot of evil people that serve a, a satanic religion and you have a dictator and you kill him off. There's like a thousand more ready to step in and be the next dictator and they love it so. But here, we see that the earth is at rest. And we're going to find out who is the main instigator of these wars. And um, maybe you don't believe in Satan. Maybe you do. But he exists. And in this version of the Bible, King James Bible, sometimes I read from the New American Standard. There are so many good versions. But this version calls him Lucifer. He's Satan, the shining one. Evil, dark, darkness. The dark side, if you will. Verse 7, the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yeah, the fir trees rejoice at thee. And the cedars of Lebanon saying, since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming 
it stirreth up the dead for thee. Even all the chief ones of the earth it hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. And they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave in the noise of the viols. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Lucifer became just like a man, cast into Hades, the Abuso, the bottomless pit, the center of the earth, in the spiritual realm. I don't really think if you took a big drill and drilled to the center of the earth, you'd find hell, though it's very hot there physically, but we're talking about in another dimension, another in the spiritual realm. Now, Satan was cast out of his, the third heaven, where God the Father, but in the spiritual realm, in the second heavens, where the spiritual powers are, Lucifer and his angels, and the the angelic beings, they have interaction to some extent. We don't really know. You read the book of Job, you read Jude, you get some access to kind of what goes on in the dimensions. And, and Satan was cast out from the third heavens, but he has access, we'll just call it the second heaven, you know, the spiritual realm, other than what we see, but not quite where the heavenly father dwells with the angelic beings and with the Lord Jesus at his right hand. Um, but he has access to like the second, the second heavens, if, if you will. Maybe there's more heavens in different dimensions, but the point being is he has access to the spiritual realm, obviously, because he's not walking around here on the earth. One day he will be, um, but now he's just, he has access to the, to the spiritual realm. But in this time, he's going to have had walked on this earth as man, because he's, we're going to see in Revelation, he's kind of cast out from that spiritual realm and put right here into this realm where we're walking. And then uh, at the end of the tribulation period, he's uh, going to be chained uh, for a thousand years, and he will be thrown into the abyss with everybody else, like it says here. And... Um, and that's going to be his home for about a thousand years. And we're, when we see that right here, this is when this has taken place. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Man, I see in this world both on the social media networks where people make references to other people as he's a god. It's like, oh man, do you understand what you're saying? It's like, there's only one God, and that's our Heavenly Father, Yahweh, and his Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. They are God. They are one. They are Elohim. And when people say he's a god, maybe they understand, you know, or we're... Jesus talks about the judges. They are representative of God, so they're, they use the small caps letter of God as a judge, as being a mediator between God and man. Kind of like the priests were in the Old Testament, kind of like a mediator between God and men. But when people refer to a person as like he's a God, there is only one God. And we have only access through him, through Jesus Christ, in him. So it says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, like God. Whoo That's arrogant. That's pompous. That's brazen. That's wicked. Lucifer said he wants to be like the most high God. 
Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man who made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of the prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, even every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain. Thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under the feet. So his desolation will be like the desolation of a dragon that is spent, defeated, cast out, stomped, and thrown into hell. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. So now we kind of are transporting in and out of the real Lucifer, and then Lucifer's children, his his advocates, his, his ministers. Lucifer has ministers. He has ministers in the church. They tell you that the homo movement is good for today, that it's okay if people live together. That's, it's okay because whatever, because you're poor and you can't afford to get married, and it's okay to just live together, right? and it's okay to smoke, you know, this and that. And No, no, all those things are evil. They're wrong. The Bible condemns them, okay? Those are sins that need to be exercised, church discipline, and they are to be uh, reprimanded, corrected, and eventually, if they refuse to repent, they are to be cast out of the body of Christ, out of the family, out of your circles of love, your fellowship, until they repent. That's the point of discipline, is to bring change, because God's word commands it. Not so that you see fruit and say, well, nothing's happened, so let's just change it all back to the way it was. No. You exercise discipline because the word of God says to do it. We obey. We obey. All right. For I will rise against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant and son and nephew, saith the Lord, I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. It does seem that Babylon, Iraq, that region, is going to be a megasis of capitalism, of trade, of commerce, shipping, riches, slavery, probably prostitution, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, drugs, pornography, uh, jewels, uh, whatever. We see Babylon is that region. You know, Babylon is Iraq, you know, around the Euphrates, Tigris River. That's, that's Babylon. And there's a spiritual Babylon that's like a religious system, and there's a Babylon that's a real, a real thing. And this real thing here is going to exist during this time. It's going to, like, resurrect a little bit. It's going to be very wealthy. And even though when it's great wealth, the beast will hate this harlot and destroy it, despite its great wealth. Because the beast doesn't share. Satan doesn't share rule. He doesn't share a throne with anybody. He might say to you, yeah, let's rule together. But eventually he's going to off you because he is the only one that wants to rule and be supreme. Everybody else only serves him. He doesn't share. I'll also make it a possession for the bittern pools of water. I'll sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. As I have purposed, so it shall stand. That I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains, tread him underfoot, and they shall... 
Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? In the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. So they prophesied way back in the Old Testament of all this happening. Some of it was happening at that time with Babylon. And they probably thought it was Babylon then, but it's not because Babylon was kind of laid waste a little bit. But we're going to see a resurgence of Babylon growing to power again. If not bef during the tribulation, possibly before the tribulation, uh, many, many generations, or maybe just as the tribulation starts. We don't really know. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestine, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. And the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety, and I will kill thy root with famine, and he shall slay thy remnant. Howl, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestinia, art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation that the Lord hath founded? Zion and the poor of his people shall trust in it. Zion will again be God's blessed people. And they're kind of blessed now. It's not, you know, Israel is a very fruitful nation. They have a lot of fruit trees. The linen industry is very strong there. Tourism, you know. But it's not like it's going to be because they still reject the Messiah. And it's sad, but it's the truth. So until next time from the Bears, Jim, God bless. We'll see you.